Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jerome Delay, and I'm the head of the entertainment division at Twin Midern. Welcome to MIP TV and this world premiere TV screening. Here we are on the Côte d'Azur, a city that celebrates great cinema in May and fantastic television here at MIP TV in April. So, what could be more appropriate than to bring you the much anticipated international drama Riviera, created by Academy Award winning writer, film and TV director Neil Jordan from an original idea by Paul McGuinness. Our thanks go to Sky Vision for choosing MIP TV to premiere this remarkable series which takes us to the darker side of a life of luxury on the Mediterranean coast. Riviera has been described as bringing to its audience a cast of morally ambiguous character, complex relationships, and audacious excess. We are very proud to have with us tonight the spectacular cast, which includes Julia Stiles, <laughs> Lena Olin, Adrian Lester, Dimitri Leonidas, Roxanne Duran, together with executive producers Lisa Marshall, Paul McGuinness, as well as the series producer Foz Allen. Thank you all for taking the time to join us tonight. And now, please join me in welcoming on stage Sky Vision commissioning editor Cameron Watch. Thanks so much. Thank you. At this festival, a year ago, Jeremy Darrick spoke of Sky's ambitions for our original production slate that we deliver a pipeline of premium drama that sits alongside the HBO and Showtime catalog, which play exclusively on the Sky Atlantic channels, providing the definitive package of content worth paying for to 20 million subscribers across Europe. Riviera is a show that really delivers on that promise. From Oscar-winning Neil Jordan, with an A-list cast, directing and producing team, we have a distinct, thrilling, and entertaining show that complements other shows in the catalogue, such as Fortitude, Tin Star, and Britannia, titles that are diverse and distinctive, but also offer the viewer the ultimate and experiential, memorable storytelling. This is drama to love, drama to talk about. Thank you to MIP and Reed Meadham for inviting us to premiere the show, and on behalf of Sky and Sky Vision, I'd like to publicly thank the exceptional team that have brought this series together, and also our brilliant co-producing partners at Altice. We hope you love the show as much as we do, and enjoy your time in the Riviera. Thank you. Good evening. No answer? Ladies and gentlemen, very welcome to the world premiere screening of Riviera. What a stunning visual feast. If you love this first episode, just wait for the second. It gets better and better. Trust me, I have already watched six in two days. Guilty. I'm delighted to have five special guests on stage this evening, and I need your help. Please put your hands together for Julia Stiles, <laughs> Lena Olen, Adrian Lester, Foz Allen, and Cameron Roach. Good to see you. Please. Hello. Hello. 
thank you very much for joining me on stage. My pleasure. And thank you for a fantastic show. Let's dive right in. I can't see you. Just move around. That's better. I hope the camera doesn't mind. Uh, how does it feel to be back to the French Riviera? Feels great. Great. <laughs> Oh, everybody, you don't know if, if we're going to do this as a one word <laughs> answers. <laughs> Last time we were out here, um, the whole town was dead. And I think it was January, and we were on a rooftop opposite. And it was quite cold. And it's just so different to be back and seeing the whole place buzzing and sunny. And so, yeah, you guys shot from the summer through to winter, didn't you? So you saw it in all seasons. And uh, for the show, it had to be, um, we had to maintain this summer feel. So a lot of us, especially Julia were, and, and Lena, were standing outside in January, freezing, <laughs> pretending it was um, summer with just very, very light clothing on. They were brilliant about it. Talking of Julia and Lena, tell me about the relationship between the characters of the wife and the ex-wife, because you have managed to create this rather anti-chemistry, but this keeps changing and changing as the plot progresses. How did you achieve that incredible bond or anti-bond, whatever you want to call it? Um, it was a combination of, I think, our natural chemistry off, off screen. Um, Lena and I, I think the writers ended up seeing how, how our strengths and how we interacted with each other. And we approached the characters with mutual respect. So what, one thing that appealed to me, which we only touch on a little bit in the first episode, but it gets deeper as the series goes on, is that it's not, our relationship isn't just one thing. On the surface, yes, we're rivals, we're jockeying for the, the control of this family, um, and there's the, the possessiveness over the relationship to our deceased husband, but there's also mutual respect, as I said, and, um, and sometimes there's an allegiance between the two of them just because they, they need each other to get what they want. I think also the setup is the classic when you see a boy and a girl and you know that they hate each other and you kind of have a feeling they're gonna end up loving each other. But the setup is made so that it's, it's impossible for them to like each other. And if you think about the new wife lives with my children in my home and the husband is dead and it's sort of a very sensitive situation. But then as the story goes along, it's impossible for them not to like each other or need each other or help each other and or create uh, an uh, allegiance of sorts. Yeah, yeah. And and um, and I think that was really fun for us to work with the sort of the, the the sort of they have to hate each other but they really can't and that's uh, that was interesting to And just when you think with. you know what the relationship is it changes. Yeah. That's always Absolutely. surprising. Yeah. yeah. Wait until episode yeah. 4. God damn it. Sorry. <laughs> Cameron, the initial idea comes from Paul McGuinness. Walk me through how this idea turned into this remarkable series. Well, I think for us on Sky Atlantic in particular, we, we have already commissioned a number of thrillers like The Tunnel. And I think what stood out for this as a piece is the kind of character journey. And I think what has been so compelling to watch across the 10 episodes is you're following this Alice in her fucked up wonderland make sense of this place. And just as you feel like you're making sense of the world, it all shifts on its axis and keeps shifting. And I think for us, the exciting thing was to have a compelling thriller, but also, as you've highlighted, these amazing unputdownable characters who you just want to spend time with and a world you want to spend time in. And I think across the kind of Atlantic year, it's important to have different tones and flavors. And from being in Fortitude, we're just about to launch Gorilla, to go into Riviera is a very different flavor for us. So it feels like it stands out for us. The world of your Riviera is one of extreme wealth, perhaps even rare for Hollywood. How did you manage to get access to that world so that the series is, uh, looks and feels authentic? Spent a lot of money. <laughs> it's a rich world, and, uh, but uh, what, what's great about being in the Riviera and shooting in the Riviera rather than going somewhere else and creating it is that everything is accessible. Of course it costs money and lads with all productions this time and effort and energy, but actually it's the real thing. So you saw you know, G9 jets, you saw super yachts, you saw giant boats, you saw big cars. They're all sourced from here. It's, it's the real thing. 
Did you guys actually, during production, live in the villa? Or did you just come as location? <laughs> it, I was, did. it was you a did? villa. I did for a little bit, um, because it was like an hour away or more in traffic each way to get to uh, set, and we were there shooting for quite a bit of time. And then eventually there's one episode that almost entirely takes, takes place at the villa, so I was scheduled to be there for three or four weeks, but then it got to be a little too close. There's like no separation between work and your off time. I would wake up in the morning and there would be grips setting up shots, uh, so I started to get a little batty, and they let me get a hotel room. While you were answering that, Adrian was giving me a very meaningful smile. <laughs> I wonder what he means by that. I tried. I was a good trooper for a long time, and then Foz was really nice and, and said, no, you don't have to stay there. It's fine. And meanwhile, everybody else was commuting every day, so... Adrian, I have a little task for you. Would you please get up, walk to the artwork, and inspect it for us? and tell me whether it's fake or real. This is not a hint about what happens in episode four. Absolutely not. OK, this be, is me getting up. Adrian, be very careful of the man. If you touch the artwork, he might waterboard you on a stage. He's done worse before. Um, it's very difficult. Um, uh, <clears throat> I think. This is not the real painting. You sure? I'm fairly sure. But what about the sniper up there? No, there's no sniper there. <laughs> no, that's just for Adrian, don't worry. It's, I wouldn't worry about you. But Adrian, you... you... I've, used, I've used all my years of schooling in <laughs> Birmingham and uh, my training as an actor, and I brought all of that knowledge of art <laughs> to, uh, to look at that picture and tell you that I don't think it's the real thing. Okay. But the question to ask really is we saw that painting, or one that looked very like it, twice. Once blown upon a yacht at and once twice. at the funeral of the person who was blown upon the yacht. How is that possible? How episode that 10. Possible? The, the one thing I have learned in my sixth episode is that the motto of the show is you cannot trust anyone. So I think that is, that is the one thing to go with. Adrian, you act and you also direct episodes seven and eight, which I haven't seen. Cameron, when are you going to get me those four episodes? Both. Because I'm Stand having both. withdrawal <laughs> something. <laughs> <sighs> Tell me about both sides of the game. Um, I was aided by a fantastic crew, an amazing crew, fantastic group of actors. Uh, Dimitri and Roxanne, who are still sitting down there, who are not up here being watched by everyone. Um, and chiefly, um, you can only be as good as the people who are working with you. And so with Foz literally by my side as a producer, um, we had great scripts. We had some very difficult days, some very difficult things to get through. But, um, you know, we had a great team and we... we we had the Riviera, so all you do is really, you have these great actors, give them the script, point the camera at them in this setting, and it kind of plays itself. Shall we ask these great actors as well? How does it feel to work with Adrian as a director? I'm right here, I'm right <laughs> here. Right Can here. you please turn around? <laughs> I found that he was so, because I hadn't really, you had dealt with, because the two characters, you and Carver, have much more to do with each other, and we have more towards the end of the show, and then I had worked with Adrian as a director, where he's so laser focused and he's so incredibly on the whole time. And, and then he came in as an actor and it was like another person. He was goofing around and he was like, where, where did this man come from? And then you realize the responsibility for a director. And I'm married to one and I had to go home and be like, I understand now the pressure you're under because you could clearly sense that so the weight great, of the world. Great service for and your now relationship. Now I'm only acting. You know that was uh, it was it it was um, it was very clear. And I love you as both uh, the director and and actor. Wouldn't you say Thank that you. it's very different when he acts than when he directs? Oh he, yeah, much more relaxed when you're acting. Yeah. Not that you were nervous directing. <laughs> First of all, it was fan I'm going to be the earnest American. Sincerely, it was fantastic having him direct us because he, he you took such care. 
care for the actors and uh, and you were always you you made everybody pause so that you could give us the time to get everything that we needed in order to feel comfortable and 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 present in a scene it was wonderful but yeah especially after you had directed then all of a sudden it was like easy breezy cakewalk for you <laughs> coming to set and just having to say lines um, no, it was great. And he also knew, he, he had already was familiar with these characters too, so there was kind of a uh, shorthand that we had that was really nice. Uh, Foz, did you treat this uh, production as if it was a long film, the same sort of setup? Uh, no, not really. I mean, you know, kind of, there aren't that, there aren't 10 hour films. You know, the, the structures, the processes, the way you organize things are very different, different locations, different, uh, different systems. Uh, um, you aim to deliver, you know, ten mini films, ten complex, engaging, relationship-strong stories, uh, uh, and that, as you plan and work through those, you take the bits of everything and hold them together, in, you know, tightly. Uh, uh, so the, you know, our central location, the villa, uh, uh, we went back and back and back and back to. We didn't shoot everything out for one to ten as you might do in a movie. So there's a kind of sense in which we're finding the story as we go and letting it grow and, you know, the, the strangeness and wonderfulness of uh, Neil's world is kind of, it's a flavor on the mouth that's extraordinary. Uh, what's also, sorry if I just jump on that, what's also evident in a series like this is that you get the scripts for one and two and you start shooting them and episodes three and four come in. Um, they've already been preconceived, but by the time the writers are working on five and six, they have access to material that you've already done as an actor for one and two. So as well as working off the story in the Bible that they've got, they can also look at what your character is like on screen and draw from the elements you're already bringing to the character. And so the two things start to evolve together. Um, and you might reach the same conclusion that you would have if you just followed, if they'd just written without watching you, but the way the writers get there is, especially for seven and eight, nine and ten, is absolutely based on what you've already brought to the character in episodes one, two, three and four. And I think similarly for locations as well, because I think that by the time you get to your block and you're in the opera house or Episode 9, there's an amazing football stadium sequence. I think that you guys, being in this world, were able to suggest locations into the story that they knew were achievable. And that adds value on the screen as well. Yes, and that's about being here for a long time, having long-term relationship. Peninsula Films, who are our fixers here, were suggesting places, the location people finding places. You go driving and go, wow, look at that. You know, uh, yeah, it's very, very encouraging putting foundations and roots in here. But I think for the actors, as painful and sometimes exhausting as it is, not to have the material laid out for you, as you would probably with a movie or if everything is written, I think looking back at it now, it was probably kind of rewarding the fact that we could take from what we had already done. And we as actors and you guys were very open to listening to us when we said, there's no way she can do this. And I feel that she, and, and it was sort of a very living, creature the 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 script um which was exciting and somewhat exhausting but now looking back i was like i think that the characters came to life in a way that maybe if somewhat somebody sat down and wrote the whole thing and this is the map and you follow that and we don't want any discussion then uh, i think it might have been kind of rewarding the fact that we didn't have every single episode written out. And I think, I think that's true of the female characters as well. I think Liza Marshall, who I think is here somewhere, was very good at kind of really thinking about the female psyche. And I think we had some brilliant young female writers on the team as well, like Marnie Dickens and Sophie Petzl. And I think that they were also really good at, at, at drawing those stories out, particularly, again, for the central character of Georgina. This beautiful uh, cinematic storytelling is fast becoming the norm in TV. As actors, do you now prefer TV, or is cinema and theater still your preferred temple? I loved being able to explore and live a character for um, what amounts to about 10 hours of storytelling, you know, as opposed to an hour and a half, which would be a movie, and working with five different directors and being excited about the next script coming in and then giving notes and then collaborating with, with the producers and the writers and seeing this thing grow. And I have to say, uh, we, only, we finished shooting, what was it, like a month and a half ago, two months ago? Mm -hmm. And I know what happens in the next eight episodes, nine episodes, mm -hmm. but 
at watching the end of this, sincerely, I really want to know what happens. <laughs> it was like, it was very um, gripping. And I was there filming the whole thing, but I just feel like so it's so interesting pain, to see right? this. That I need those no. four episodes. Now. No, I mean, I, what I mean is that it's so, what is great about working on a TV show like this is it actually was very, very collaborative yeah. um, in, some t in ways that sometimes you don't find on a film. Yeah. How about you, Lena? Mm, I, it, it seems like making a show like this where you have all these episodes, it's a little bit of a combination of doing theater and doing a film because you have the process that goes on for a long time and you really get to know the character like you would if you're rehearsing a play. You get a lot, you have a huge back pack of experiences when you get into episode, the, the later episodes and that's extremely fun and rewarding and I think empowering for actors and I think that's why so many actors are attracted to TV because it gives us more power actually uh, in, a, in a very good sense and it becomes somewhat of a family, the people you work with and uh, no, it's, it's, Ed, it's all good. <laughs> Adrian, looks like you're going to have the last word. <laughs> There's a mistake. Um, <laughs> I don't have a preference between theater, TV, okay. or film. I, uh, um, on theat in theater, you achieve something with a role, and when the last night comes, that, that role is gone. What you've achieved is lost to time. Um, when you work on screen, at least the work is frozen so that you have some memory or some semblance of what you achieve, managed to achieve. But in terms of performing and how the work feels, the repetition of theater, I feel, really uh, crafts an actor. I think um, having to churn out, say, a Shakespeare to 1,100 people for six months, it, it, it really works your acting muscles. Um, but on screen, the clarity of thought and the precision of thought is, um, works, is paramount. Those time machines have shown us zero for the past five, six minutes, and then they started blinking as well. I'm worried that they might now start exploding. So I'm afraid, although I can s talk to you about Riviera for hours, we'll have to bring it to a close. Thank you very much for an absolutely wonderful show. I wish you all the very success with it. And please come back for seasons two, three, four, and five. Please Thank join you. me in thanking our amazing panel. Thank you. Thank you.